Hey Eric Yofiens, I'm your host, Dr. Paul Edward Montgomery Ramirez, and I am just coming back from a short break to prepare for the upcoming academic year. Yeah, that is right, I do sometimes get paid to do this ranting thing. And I wanted to welcome all the new and returning Archeofiends to my channel. If this is your first time watching, I hope you like my mouth words. And if you haven't already, please consider giving us a like and a subscribe. It is greatly appreciated. Now there has been a lot of news about our ancient ancestors recently, so much so that I've had to divide what was gonna be one video into currently three. So I was initially going to focus on the media use that was involved in each of these cases, but there's just so much going on in all of these that while media is definitely still a massive part of all of it, there are other aspects to these stories and uh, the research that I think really needs to be highlighted in their own respect. And so for this video, I'm going to talk about the recent controversy surrounding ancient hominids, privatization, and spectacle, or in other words... I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Virgin Galactic is one of a few private companies owned by egotistical wealthy douchebags that are currently offering space flights to the public. And by the public, I mean the incredibly wealthy. A ticket for a roughly hour-long galactic flight is about $450,000. So on Galactic's third flight, or mission, or whatever the hell we want to call whatever they're doing, uh, that took place on the 8th of September of 2023, there were some passengers that caused a bit of a controversy. When the spacecraft first landed on our seaboard, it was Dr. Milo who salvaged it. He studied it and uh, half understood it. I don't believe it. The VSS Unity launched with fossilized remains of two hominins, Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi. For future reference, I'm going to shorten their names throughout the uh, rest of this video. And their remains were carried on the flight by South African billionaire Tim Nash. Now, other fossils have been going out into space for decades. The astronaut Lauren Acton brought the fossilized eggshell of a Myasaura with him onto his 1985 mission to Space Lab 2. And a Salafesis skull went on the Endeavour in 1998 to the space station Mir. And even in 2021, Virgin's competitor Blue Origin launched about 200 dinosaur fossils into space as part of the Dream Big Alabama uh, project that works to support children in uh, accessing STEM education. But these were the very first fossils of any hominin species to go up into space. So let me pause here just for a second and I guess give a little bit of biology. So we categorize species by using ever-narrowing sets of terms, and this is called taxonomy. So all animals are put into a singular kingdom, and all mammals then belong to the same class. Now, when it comes to apes, our terminologies have been a little bit fudgy. So all apes belong to a superfamily called a hominoids. And then all of the great apes, so chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and us, belong to the hominid family. And until about the 1990s, this word, hominid, was used scientifically for humans and our direct ancestors from Australopithecus to, uh, you know, the species in the genus Homo, which we belong to, Homo sapiens. But through a ton of genetic research, we found that having humans classified as so distant to other apes didn't actually make any sense. So the hominid family was shifted over to suit that actuality. And so our old uh, classification of hominid became the taxonomic tribe hominin. And so these fossils aren't, you know, the predecessors of animals who are only distantly related to us. They're much closer to our own ancestors. So that is a bit of a big deal. And I guess we can thank paleontologist Lee Berger for making this happen. Dr. Berger grew up in the United States and got his doctorate at the University of Witwatersrand in 1994 in South Africa. And he's uh, played an active role in research into hominids ever since then. He was the director of the project that found the Malapa fossil where A. sediba was discovered, and his work at the Rising Star Cave in 2013 uncovered the first Homo naledi. He's 
also been uh, one of National Geographic's explorers since 1996. And with all of that, he's been very active in public outreach and media around his research. He has worked to raise the profile of paleoanthropology and the Cradle of Humanity UNESCO World Heritage Site internationally, which, you know, all of that is really good stuff. Researchers should absolutely be making their work widely available to the public, and more specialists should devote more of their energies to outreach. So it was in the name of research and outreach that Berger wrote to the South African Heritage Resources Agency about getting permission to send the fossils of A. Sediba and H. Naledi over to New Mexico for the space flight with Virgin Galactic. He said that sending these into space would provide us a unique opportunity for research. In particular, Berger stated that it would be possible to study them upon their return from space and see how they were affected by the trip radioactively. Because science has just been dying to know how hominid fossils are impacted by being out in outer space's radiation for a very brief time. That's been an incredible gap in our understanding of humanity, I guess. The U.S. and other countries have used mice, rats, and primates in their experiments and their media spectacles around the space race. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, macaques, all named Albert, were used to uh, test travel by rocket. Uh, through means like suffocation and parachute failures, all of the Alberts died. Until Albert the Sixth, who survived his flight. And died two hours later. So success. This is an image of the squirrel monkey named Miss Baker uh, that was used to promote her launch in the Jupiter AM-18 rocket and an ensuing spectacle when she safely returned and was then awarded a Certificate of Merit for Distinguished Service by the ASPCA for the carefully controlled scientific use of animals for the mutual benefit of man and animals. After all, all those tarsiers have just been dying to start their own colony up in the asteroid belt. In 1961, a young chimpanzee became one of six selected to serve as part of Project Mercury to see if apes, and then by extension humans, could survive space travel. On the 16th of January, he uh, went up into space for 16 minutes, 39 seconds in an MR2 rocket. And now, uh, it would have been bad press to send an ape with a name into space, only to have him die, like all those macaques. So, while he was known by his handlers as Chop Chop Chang, and he was officially named Number 65, it wasn't until he safely returned to Earth that he was actually given a real name. Ham, the Astro Chimp. Uh, now, Ham actually refers to the lab that he was housed at for the entire project, the Holloman Aerospace Medical Center. Ham, I guess. Now, the ethics of using animals as experiments in scientific research is pretty murky. Lots of animals have suffered and died in the pursuit of going out into space, and it's worth thinking about the trade-off between well-being and scientific outcomes. And sure, going into space is f***ing awesome, don't, don't get me wrong about that, but what are the costs to how we have and do approach progress? The second U.S. chimpanzee in space, Enos, was given over 70 corrective shocks to his feet while he was up in space, thanks to malfunctioning equipment, and he died a year later following pretty severe health issues. It's a really f story, but the argument stood that conducting these tests on a chimpanzee was, even if things went poorly, better than subjecting a human to the risk of testing. Break a few eggs to make an omelet and all that. But in the case of the Virgin Galactic flight, what was even the argument for the research to weigh against the risk presented to the remains of A. Sediba and H. Naledi? Now, I'm not a specialist in the conservation of fossilized remains, but I am pretty sure that carrying them into your trouser pocket while you're floating around in zero gravity probably isn't a part of best practice. Now, let's also keep in mind that there's not an ignorable potential that launching a space rocket might end in a less than successful outcome. So 
there probably should be a good reason for the risk, especially considering that that shoulder of A. sediba that went up was the very first evidence of that species and serves as the reference point or the type specimen that defines the entire species. So there's that, and what is the overwhelming benefit to being able to study the impacts of radiation on fossilized remains? No, I, I am being serious here. If, if there's any uh, paleoanthropologist or bioarchaeologist out there who actually sees the research opportunities outweighing the risks, you know, I would love to hear the reasoning. But hear me out here. Maybe. Maybe. That entire stated research potential was just a bunch of bullshit, and this was all a publicity stunt. It's often a hard sell to make science interesting to the public, but science doesn't really actually suffer from any of that. Space is sexy, smoking hot, and it feeds into the collective imaginings of the future and for what humanity can be, you know, something bigger than us. Rocket launches are spectacles on their own, whether they go right or not. And space exploration is filled with so much emotion that we can feel absolutely devastated when a little robot guy runs out of power on Mars. And that's great. No, not, not the slow, tragic death of Oppie, but the way in which people can be grabbed by the wonders of space. So it's not a big stretch to see why space exploration finds a lot of symbols and attachment. The National Air and Space Museum holds in trust over 60,000 artifacts, and about 20% of those can actually be viewed on display at museums, from space capsules from the Apollo program, to specially engineered soda cans to use in zero gravity. But there's even more than that. Some of the primates who were used as test subjects by NASA went on to be taxidermied and put on display, like the rhesus monkey, Abel, who went into space two years before Ham. Obviously, this is not stuffed, Abel. That wouldn't be cool. In 1983, when Ham went to the chimpanzee afterlife, known from the most ancient times as Valhalape, the government planned to have Ham stuffed and displayed at the Smithsonian Institution, but it was met with incredible public backlash. For instance, a sophomore from West High School in Painted Post, New York, wrote that she was shocked that ham would be stuffed and displayed. A chimpanzee is not a green pepper. And, you know, she's right. He's not a green pepper. He would have been a stuffed ham. I... I don't feel good about that one. Taxiderming and using ham as a museum display was more controversial than some of the other primates who were part of the NASA experiments. Ham stopped being just some monkey or something, and through the media attention that was placed on him, he suddenly seemed a lot more human than many of the other test animals. He seemed to smile in all those images. Our little hero was so excited to explore space. Never mind the fact that chimpanzees don't actually smile when they're happy or they're excited, but when they are anxious and terrified. But, you know, never mind those are gross ethical realities. And sure, his skeleton is still in a museum archive today, but it's not on display, and the rest of him was given a, I guess, proper burial, which still isn't great, but at least he didn't get the Swedish Lion special. Where then do we place humanity and then respect? So in the paperwork that surrounded the fossils A. Sediba and H. Naledi, they're described as being paleontological rather than, say, human remains. So where does society draw that line? H. Naledi, for example, is a part of genus Homo, which we belong to. So should we feel so comfortable thinking about them just as being animals? Can we really remove that layer of ethical concerns that we would have for humans and human remains? That's presuming that we care about people today enough to not exploit them or their remains. Yep. Lieberger's application to Sara is pretty clear in what its true purpose is. There's that whole bullshit research goal in the paperwork, but it's pretty obvious that the main goal is the pageantry. The proposal description reads, 
in the interest of promoting science and bringing global recognition for our Science of Human Origins research in South Africa in particular. I am proposing that Tim Nash, a Virgin Galactic astronaut, selected for the third commercial and second civilian flight into space, carry two fossils into space, one of Australopithecus sediba from the Malapa site, which is on his property, and one of Homo naledi from the Rising Star site. This would make these fossils the first extinct humans into space and act as a sign of respect by humanity to our African ancestors who gave us the technology, skills, and mind that allows this perhaps greatest expression of human technological achievement, the exploration of space. The carrying of a Homo naledi fossil into space would be particular poignant given the major discoveries recently announced. Major media partners will assist in using this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to bring awareness to science, exploration, human origins, and South Africa and its role in understanding humankind's shared African ancestry. Really stirring stuff. And it's incredibly important to note that Berger wasn't just some lone weirdo making a request to shove fossil hominids into a rocket and briefly hurl them into the coldness of space. His effort was supported by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Witwatersrand, Professor Zeblon Villacasi, and Sir Richard Branson, the head of Virgin Galactic, and Dr. Ian Miller, the Chief Scientific Officer at the National Geographic Society. Now, Sarah approved on the 28th of July with 13 conditions, including that Sara would not be liable for anything that happened to the fossils, and that the responsibility over them fell entirely on Berger and Nash. Now, enthusiasm for this scientific outreach wasn't shared by everyone. So, lecture in Geological Sciences at the University of Cape Town, Dr. Robin Pickering, stated that to treat ancestral remains in such a callous, unethical way, to blast them into space just because you can, there's no scientific merit to this. And senior lecturer in archaeology at Cape Town, Dr. Yannis Nsale, also spoke out against the use of these hominids for media exposure, noting that this is basically a perpetuation of the past, very ugly aspects of paleoanthropological research, wherein colonial forces and scientists were able to do whatever they wished with whatever and whomever they dug up. Berger and Pals, you know, their choice to transport these two hominids thousands of miles away and needlessly put them in danger forces us to consider exactly what made them feel like they had the right that they could and should even ask to even do this. Now, the phrasing of Berger's application really gives us our first hint of his perspective on these hominids and what exactly they represent. His opening statement is that the space launch will bring global recognition for our science of human origins research. Our. Now, that might seem like a pretty uncharged thing to say. You know, he wants to see the profile of paleoanthropology being lifted up by hitching itself onto some high-profile space stuff. And he went further to mention that this link-up would be particularly well-timed because of a recent major discovery about Homo naledi that had grabbed media attention earlier in the year. And by major discovery, he means a pretty massive and probably overblown assertion that he himself made about some remains at the Rising Star Cave. Now, all of that will be be in its own episode, but it's a little sus that in one hand he wanted to talk about how much more human Homo naledi was, and then in the other he's totally fine with dehumanizing and using their remains as a prop. It's kind of like this really has very little to do with Homo naledi and more to do with Lee Berger. Just keep in mind that both of the hominids who were taken into space by Tim Nash were discovered by projects led by Dr. Berger. And he stated in the application that Tim Nash has a direct link to the remains of a sediba because it was found on Nash's property. And that wasn't by a random chance either. So over the last several years, Tim Nash has bought a majority of the land in the UNESCO World Heritage Site called the Cradle of Humankind to create a privatized tourism industry around sites connected to human origins in South Africa. You know, because he believes that's the only way to protect them, to turn them into a commodity that he would financially benefit from. He makes over 25 million rand, or 1.3 million dollars, 
from his boutique hotel. He's the director of two private companies that he calls Reserves, and he ran a charitable foundation until it was closed in 2020 for non-compliance on its tax returns. It only actually filed tax returns from 2009 to 2013 anyhow, but hey-ho. Now, I'm not saying that Berger and Nash don't believe in the benefit to science and humanity that they're touting as their motivations. But it would be really naive to think that they don't position themselves as being central to that, and that what benefits them, by extension, then benefits their noble mission. They are the protagonists here, and as such, the ethics are in their favor. It seems that to them the heritage is primarily theirs, and that it is through their goodwill that the rest of us get to learn about and engage with it. It's all really on the nose when you think about it. Berger has academic prestige, and his work was supported by National Geographic. Nash is a billionaire who, whose private ownership of an important cultural landscape would allow him to withdraw access to that property as he sees fit. The influence that they had to get their way shouldn't be ignored. We have two men who believe that they have some special stake to ownership over ancient remains, leveraging their relative powers of money, connections, and access to be granted the ability to link those remains onto a private company's commodification of space travel. It's pretty common, especially in the US and the UK, to paint state agencies as being ineffective, bloated, and stifling. That private industry and competition breed innovation and can solve our problems for cheaper and better than any government can. But a privatized model, broadly speaking, seeks to make the most money it can for its shareholders. And the model of financial maximization isn't actually very conducive to innovation. And Committing resources to long-term projects with no guarantee on a return is a liability to corporations and isn't actually something that's aligned with uh, what many boards and stakeholders would want. The development of GPS began in the 1970s through the U.S. Department of Defense and after decades of government-funded R&D has become a free resource that's changed how we live our lives and countless private industries have either benefited from or exist because of GPS. Private industry frequently benefits from state support, and even companies like SpaceX have been heavily funded by the state. And then they, you know, say that they're an alternative to government agencies. Meanwhile, state-funded space research gives people a lot for their tax dollars. And these outputs are actually pretty easy to look into, what with annual reports being publicly available. Research at the ISS over the last few years has developed improved water purification systems, that technology now being used in water-scarce communities around the world. The advanced astroculture system was made to improve air quality and the health of plant life. And this system was then used to improve the shelf life of food here on Earth and can be used to further combat logistical issues in food scarcity globally. And I could go on with its research into health and physics, for example, but you can just read the report, which is something you really can't do for a lot of private companies. Science fiction and fantasy have inspired generations of people looking to the stars. Many of them have centered around collectivist or socialist projects that have brought human societies across the galaxy. We've got Star Trek that's always been critical of capitalism. I mean, the Ferengi are an often absurd caricature of capitalism. And authors like Ursula K. Le Guin and Octavia Butler have critiqued capitalism and imagined futures beyond it. Even sci-fi action films from the Reagan era and early 90s, like Total Recall and RoboCop, were heavy critiques of capitalism and privatization. There's really no shortage of recent media that shows an incredibly dystopian future brought on by privatization. Elysium is another great example of a warning of what the commodification of space would do, even though I prefer to never be reminded that Matt Damon exists. The privatization of space 
is anything but democratizing. Just keep in mind that a single ticket for one of those Virgin Galactic flights is nearly half a million dollars. And all that's for an experience that is shorter than sitting down and watching a dystopian Matt Damon film like Stuck on You. So, sure, the concept is that space is no longer just the realm for highly trained elites, but this has really only actually opened space up to the incredibly wealthy in the pursuit of colonizing Mars and noting that the costs would be prohibitive to many, while also recognizing that a colony would require a lot of laborers, Elon Musk has suggested a model where people could take on debt to go to Mars and then serve as laborers for the colony until that debt is worked away. Now, that might just be me, but that sounds exactly like indentured servitude. And I'm pretty sure we decided that wasn't cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that... That checks out. This all really reeks of great man theory, where our destinies are reliant on the actions of a few powerful and exemplary individuals. The common person has very little agency in this incredibly antiquated and completely undemocratic view of the world. Virgin Galactic didn't agree to let A. Sadiba and H. Naledi on board for some lofty goal. It was for media attention, which, of course, they're being given, even if it's negative. Remember that their competitor, Blue Origin, sent dozens of dinosaur fossils into space for PR and fundraising. Now, the case with Virgin is far more ethically troubling and has no charitable goal whatsoever. It's just using our heritage and our human ancestors as a media prop to help raise the public profile of a corporation and the interests of Berger and Nash. Of course, it's not a stretch to see that there was pressure on institutions to agree to Berger's request. Academia is increasingly operated as a business, and I should add poorly, and both Berger and Nash have a not small amount of weight to throw around to get their way. The consideration of the possible loss of the fossils was summed up by Bernard Zipfel, the curator at the University of Witwatersrand, who said that the fossils were specifically selected because they had been substantially recorded, scanned, casted, and photographed. But that's a troubling line of thinking. Where exactly is the line of acceptability? The famous Australopithecus, Lucy, is far better studied and documented than either of those two. You can even go and buy casts of her. So when can we send her to the bottom of the ocean in a private submarine? When is the risk of loss acceptable? And even more in the case of Nash and his development of a private tourism industry around a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Associate Professor of Cultural Heritage at University College London, Dr. Rachel King, put it this way. If I document one of South Africa's World Heritage Sites, could we then bulldoze it and put up a shopping mall? If that property is legally Nash's, then he gets to make that kind of a decision. Tourism is potentially destructive to heritage sites, so what is his threshold for acceptable risk in pursuit of money? And could researchers who wanted to do work on his land actually speak out or act against him if he would do something that endangered these sites? Who should be allowed claims to ownership over the heritage of a culture or cultures or of humanity more broadly? Should a billionaire have the first and effectively only say over how a cultural landscape gets developed for tourists? He's the director of those two reserves, after all. Call me paranoid, but that seems really suspicious. And, you know, call me a commie or whatever, but I don't think that a whole cultural landscape should be owned by an individual. Which then, all this brings me back to Lee Berger and his discoveries. Now, I get that a researcher who was the lead on a team that uncovered two different and spectacular finds might have a certain attachment to them, but that doesn't give that researcher any more claim over them than other people. Do I really need to remind folk that this isn't a treasure hunt? I'm not suggesting that researchers shouldn't get personal, involved, and emotional in their work. No, th quite the opposite to that. Especially in work that reflects the experiences and possibilities of humanity. Otherwise, 
we can become quickly unethical and harmful in our work. But in that process of being attached to our work, we also have to put our egos aside and keep in mind who exactly we're doing that work for. Outreach is incredibly important, and academics should look at themselves as having a responsibility to have their research accessible to the public. We should be working to help people develop critical thinking, to combat disinformation and pseudoscience, and to foster interest in the stories of our world. But we always have to keep in mind that we are not the great men coming down to enlighten the filthy masses. Space doesn't belong to the few and powerful. We can all look up in the sky, and our cultural heritage is not owned by the wealthy or the affluent. It belongs to all of us in differing ways. And if we as researchers lose sight of our responsibilities in pursuit of our ego, then we have also failed, and we are just consuming humanity. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be putting out a few more videos on hominids in the media a little bit later on, so do be on the lookout for those. And again, if you haven't already, please like, subscribe, and share my videos to people who you think will enjoy them, or hate watch them and write really, really mean comments. You know, whatever pitters their patter, really. Anyhow, I'm Dr. Paul Edward Montgomery Ramirez, and I will see you, Arqueofiends, next time.